This is Christina West with An Artist's Life. Today we're going to talk about art and creativity and what every artist comes up against, what writers call writer's block and artists call artist block, when we just can't seem to get over the hump and enter into that lively, dynamic, creative flow. In all my classes, uh, in every single session, there's always a creative practice. And of course, what I found over the years, and this includes myself, is that it's much easier if you're taking a class to have ways in which to overcome artist block because you're asked to do something and you do it that might not translate and transfer back at home in the studio or the kitchen table, but it does help us, you know, just move through that, that rock, that immovable rock that's always in front of us whenever we, you know, turn to a blank canvas, a black blank piece of paper, want to start a new project. It's like a vacuum inside. We all, we all know what this feels like. And, and sometimes it lasts longer than others. The feeling of artist's block, or writer's block for that matter, can actually feel like depression, what depression feels like. It feels like our creative life has been pressed down which is what depression is, is feelings and life energy and enthusiasm seems to have just disappeared like a magic wand. And, and where has it gone? Sometimes there's a life event that can be associated with why it's disappeared and something comes into your life that has to be handled and that's something that we can typically, you know, make room for and acknowledge and accept because it's temporary and then we can get back to our creative practice. But other times, like a mysterious siren, a mermaid of the sea, it dives deep and we do not know where it's gone. And there are a lot of techniques that help with lifting this veil. Because as dreams come to us to bring us new information, and they don't come to us typically to tell us what we already know, when creativity is abducted or has disappeared, there's good reasons for it. And that has to be discovered within the soul, not in the mind. The mind just uh, cuts us off at the knees. The negative mind or the inner critic, you know, the ruler, the crusher, <laughs> we, you know, the strict one, we all have names for what this feels like. That persona that you can access through active imagination you know, our, our inner critic, that is not going to be of any help because that voice will say something like, you were never really an artist in the first place. What were you thinking? Or, you know, if it doesn't win a prize, why try it? Or, it's just too hard. Just give it up. Why don't you have a drink instead? Or, 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 all the sentences that live in us, you can fill in the, the blanks. But active imagination is actually something that you can use to access where your creative life, the pneuma, the life force has gone. And active imagination is something Carl Jung came up with that is very similar to what writers live in as they're writing their narrative. Their characters come to life in their mind, in their hearts, 
And the characters, as many writers talk about, take over the writing. And the writer is really there <laughs> taking dictation. So if you have a creative life that has escaped and you are, you know, trying to sort of knock on that door and it's not opening, you know, where are you, where are you, come back, come back. You can do active imagination. And it's very also, very similar also to shamanic journey work, but without the drum. And the drum is excellent because the drum is the driver. That beat drives you in the journey. And when I'm uh, stuck, if I want to do a active imagination and I want to add a little drum to it, I'll just use a spoon or my finger on my top of my hand, and that can get you into a shamanic journey. But active imagination is simply closing your eyes and asking a question of where has my creativity gone? And right away, you will get a persona that shows itself, a he or a she. And the only issue my students have had is they don't believe the information they receive. So what I say to them is, let's pretend. Let's pretend this works, and let's pretend you are doing active imagination correctly, and let's pretend the first thing that comes is, is true. Let's just pretend, because otherwise you just stop yourself there, and you have to do the active imagination to get the information. So you close your eyes, and you're open, and let's pretend. And I am going to ask my... Uh, let's see, I'll say my dragon. Uh, I feel like my dragon self, my the unredeemed aspect of, you know, poor me, wants to take away my creativity. So I'll close my eyes, center myself, take a deep breath, three deep breaths, just... <sighs> breathe. And then I center, as I center, I ask the question. And since I know and I have a relationship with this dragon aspect of myself, that dragon appears. And I would say, where has my creativity gone? And I would just ask one sentence, not where has my creativity gone? What have you done with it? A, B, and C. I don't do addendums. I just ask one simple question. And the dragon may say something like, You waylaid your creative treasure in aspects of creativity that do not nurture your soul. And so I've hidden it. I have hidden this treasure from you. So I come back to myself and go, what, what, what's, what's the dragon talking about? I'm in a really good creative flow. I am producing. And that is, that is a question. What am I producing? The dragon has just told me that he doesn't agree with what I'm doing. And basically, an aspect of my own soul has agreed to hide my creative life so that I can wake up to what am I doing. And I do remember when something like this happened to me, and um, I had just come back from getting my master's at JFK in Transformational Arts and Consciousness. I had completed years and years of training with shamans, I felt like I could hit the ground running, and uh, I decided I, that as I worked in galleries, I figured that the net was an online, online art gallery, and I was going to sell art. And I did, very successfully. 
and I sold on eBay. eBay was uh, the site that I chose, and this was back in 2005, and it was very different at that time. And I had run into a friend of mine that I had also gone to art school in my undergrad with, and she told me the secret of eBay at that time, which is no longer true. And I did exactly what she said, and in two weeks I'd made $700. And coming back from getting your master's, and I've been gone from town for five years, I started a class, but, you know, you have to make more money with the rents in Santa Barbara. They're just astronomical. So I, I needed a second income. The problem with selling the art is the art was priced at a ridiculously low price. And it was really just sketches for 10 bucks. <laughs> at the end of... A couple of years, I had sold over 2700 or 3000 I really can't remember. I sold so much art. But what kind of art was it? I had just completed a master's in transformational arts and consciousness. I had studied with shamans since the early 90s. And I was just throwing this art out to pay the bills. And... There's nothing wrong with that because we have to live in the world. But this isn't something I was unaware of. I certainly didn't want to, um, what I felt was, prostitute myself and my talent at these low prices. Do you know how happy people were to get art for 10 bucks? And, of course, I, I brought in my, my training, my schooling. I started doing text. This is before people started doing text in art. I mean, you know, the Stampington, the whole stamp thing hadn't happened yet. It was just before that. So I built up a clientele all over the world, and it was marvelous, but I'd much rather be getting 700 or $800 for a real painting that I could put my shamanic intent into and send that out into the world. So this wasn't something I didn't understand, but I had sort of made a deal with myself that I was going to do this short term. Well, if your creativity disappeared and you have to do art every day, uh, selling, you know, four or five or six things a day I was listing, little sketches, you know, you're in production. And I have heard a version of this story from so many students and clients that come for, for consultation, private work, that somehow they've made the deal with the devil, is how we would say it. And we think it's a temporary fix, and we sort of made bargains with ourselves and God and our creative life. And then our... Artistic inspiration just disappears. And you're sitting there day after day. And I have looked at those folders during that time. And the art that I did was, was just exactly the way I felt. Depressed, uh, boring. You just go, oh, oh. But... You know, they were used to, my customer base was used to every day getting four or five pieces that they could buy. And some people were buying, like, hundreds of my work. It was just, just nutty. <sighs> like, I got a deal. I got a deal. So what happened was that my arm blew out, my right arm. And then I couldn't actually hold you know, a pen or a paintbrush or a mixed media, the muscles, uh, you know, there's words for this. Um, but so I would sit at night in a castor oil pack with a heating pad, you know, feeling, feeling blue. But that experience changed my life. And if we don't pay attention to the signals or we've made this, you know, deal with the devil. 
I'll only do it, you know, for now. But for now, it just goes on and on and on. And we stay in that job that's killing us. That just, you know, piece by piece is destroying our enthusiasm, our dynamism, our get up and go, our... Are, oh, I'm, you know, I want to, I want to start design something. I want to build those bridges. And you are not living in "It's a Wonderful Life" with Jimmy Stewart. It's not that kind of sacrifice. So while that happened, I started uh, going to thrift thrift shops, which I've done my entire life where you find, you know, absolutely fabulous mixed media pieces and, you know, yada, yada. And I found uh, some clothing. Now, I have a, had a degree in fashion design, a two-year degree in fashion design and merchandising. I did modeling and sewing. And I thought, you know, I could, I could put this on my eBay store. And I did. And it <laughs> sold so fast. I thought, oh, do you know how hard it is to make a living selling art? I mean, at that low scale, and I was doing it. And our, my rent was, I had to come up with the $4,000 for apartment, which I never lived in. And to this day, rue that time, because I grew up in the country, and I need solitude. And But that's what I did, because I went to JFK, and I had to start over. And... Clothing sold, at this time, so much faster. And guess what? I didn't have to make it. I didn't have to fix seams. You know, I didn't have to do anything, but I had to buy it. So the great thing about selling art is it comes out of your soul, and then you just have to pay materials. So I made a better profit, of course, as a, you know, commercial artist, selling art. But it saved my arm, selling fashion. And I remember at the time I had a dream. And I'm going to parse this dream a bit. I'm sitting at a table, and I'm feeling really good about myself. And I'm just doing little sketches, and I'm throwing them on the floor, and I'm doing a little sketch, and I'm throwing it on the floor. I'm, you know, that's my little choleric nature. I'm so good. But over in the same room was a figure a figure that, that has great meaning for me. And this figure was had a big frame, a picture frame. And he was cleaning this big picture frame. And as you know, I've also done museum framing. So when I woke up, I realized that it was a punny dream. I was on my little desk doing my little art, throwing little pictures on the floor, and there was this uh, teacher, I'll call him a teacher, who was had a, you know, a frame almost as tall as he was, a picture frame. So it's a bigger picture was going to be framed, right, for my life. There was a bigger picture waiting for me. And sure enough, you know, with what I could see was happening with my arm going, and of course my arm healed so fast after I switched. You know, there's always that transition period when you start one thing and you're going along, you're going along, and then you got to bring in something else. So as one is slowly going, disappearing, the other is growing. So I didn't just cold turkey anything. But I had a fabulous business of art for two or three years, and then it built into a fabulous business for clothing, and that led me into, you know, going, going to shows and finding my own manufacturers and developing my own clothing lines. And that is definitely a bigger picture, because you can't live on in $9.99, and it was breaking my heart. Now, you know Goethe, the great philosopher and poet, Goethe and writer and painter and everything else he did, scientist. But his friend, dearest friend, is 
is Schiller. And Schiller is also considered, with Goethe, two of the greatest poets of their time in history. And Schiller was so poor that he would have to write jingles to be able to buy a piece of bread and some soup. Schiller had to write jingles in order to buy a piece of bread and a bowl of soup so he could eat. Now, Schiller took the way out that many men were, are able to. He married, he married some money, and then he didn't have to worry about poverty. But he, was, he suffered, and I thought of that a great deal in the times where there's always down times in any business, and there's up times. And it's just like the flow of nature. Things are growing. Things have to be cut back. Things have to be edited. Other things need to be planted. Some things you've just got to weed out because they're just not working. Now, if I hadn't done that active imagination and variations of that through the years, I'm a dream teacher and a dream worker, so I could have worked that out from the dream itself, and only the dream. But it's just a great tool, active imagination, shamanic journey work, to access these blocks that seem to be barring us from going forward and living the life we think, you know, we want. So, magically, once we work with these inner blocks in our soul, magically the outer blocks disappear. Suddenly you, you've got an idea and you're, you're going for it on a piece of paper or a canvas or whatever your modality in media is. There are tools, though, to help you other than active imagination and journey work and dream work. You know, one of the things is to get out in nature. And I think we all know this. To get out in nature, to walk. If you have a, a small trampoline, bounce and bounce and bounce. Go for a good workout. I discovered swimming later in life, and I adore swimming. And if I get so busy in my jobs, you know, doing whatever I'm doing, and I don't swim for a week, I, I know it. I can feel it in my body, and I'll say, so what's going on? I said, we haven't swam in a week, or I haven't swam in a week and a half. And I usually swim three or four times a week, especially in summer. I swim a lot. So every time I swim, my entire world changes. I highly recommend swimming. But some people get the same thing with running or taking a hot bath with a lot of candles and putting you know, magnesium salts in the bathtub. You have to change your soma, your somatic body. You've got to nurture yourself. You have to self-nurture. And you have to know what self-nurturing is for yourself, which I have to say a lot of Americans think it's shopping, and it isn't shopping. It may be a temporary high, but, you know, shopping to alleviate a creative block doesn't typically work. Or, or or taking a class, an art class. I mean, all kinds of things can shift your world. And you have to, yourself, as the creative artist, as a writer or a dancer or a weaver or a fashion designer or a painter, whatever the deal is, you've got you've to move the energy in your body if it's stuck. Dancing is great. Dancing will move your energy. So (laughs) there's uh, one more thing I want to talk about, about a creative block. When I taught my women's spirit groups, they were four months and three and a half months and four or five months, depending on what time of the year, because I I did short classes in the summer. But at the end of our, every week I'd give them an artistic something. And it was usually... A very inexpensive black paper, uh, very inexpensive children's um, crayons or chalks, pastels, temper paints. 
because you don't want to scare people. And I find adults, much more than children, uh, tighten up with materials because it's expensive. So if you buy inexpensive materials, everybody calms down because they remember what it's like, hopefully, in kindergarten or first or second or third grade when you could, you know, mess things up. So every week they did do art. And I remember we were at a retreat. At the end of the time, we did three or four days of a retreat where we brought all our inner work, all our art, and we did more art, and we created rituals of healing for ourselves. And I remember going into the workshop space that had all the tables set up and the temper paints and the big, big pieces of paper, and there was one of my students was leaning against the door frame, and she said, Christina... I love this class, but I hate the art. I hate the art. I hate the art. You know, she said it a number of times, and I I just looked at her and said, okay, I hear that. Now let's go do some art. Now this is uh, something that you'll find as a teacher, and you want to look for it maybe in yourself or in others. And it's called the talking in opposites. So this gal had the soul of an artist, and she is an artist now. And she's done shows, and she's a painter, and yada, yada. But before that happened, she was moving into her big unconscious fear of what that new life was going to be. Because it was there. I mean, she's now been an artist for years. But that talking in opposites, that you say the opposite of what you but you don't even know it yourself. But if you're a teacher, you want to twig that. You want to, the penny drop, you, you want to hear that and hear what is, the person is not saying, which is, this is so big for me. And I am so in love. It's like I'm on my knees on the altar of art. And I cannot confess that to you. And I cannot acknowledge that within my own soul help me. And that's what I did. I didn't take care of her. I didn't say, oh, you don't have to do the art. I just said, oh, good. I I hear that. Let's go make some art. And we made all kinds of art. We also did little dolls, you know, the whole thing. So wrapping up this creativity and how blocks can take, take over and transform a life and what they might mean for us in our creative life it doesn't necessarily mean that the block is a bad thing, a negative thing. Because we immediately, you know, stick a post-it note on, this is not okay. So when creativity disappears, that's the time to take a breath, do the self-nurturing techniques I've mentioned, and create some space for you to do some active imagination work, shamanic journey work, work with your dreams, your journal, and move the body, get out in the fresh air, and live in the question of that this might be a time for you to contemplate a richer creative life for yourself and what that might look like. So this is Christina West with anartistslife.com. And online we have classes. We have online classes. Great stuff. And we also have a consulting practice for people who want to do private work and also podcasts for getting the word out and you hearing a little bit about my work. I'd love it if you'd come to An Artist's Life. There's an S after artist because it includes everybody, An Artist's Life. We're all artists. And sign up for my email list so I can send you some emails occasionally about new work. Thank you so much for listening. This is Christina West with An Artist's Life, Art and Creativity, and Overcoming Artist's Blocks.